Oscar the dog has a problem. Oscar. He's blind. Oscar. It's a genetic problem. Oscar's story is the story of the way his DNA let him down, of how a gene may fail and its consequences. What then is in the genetic code that can bring this about? The genetic code carries the complete set of instructions for an organism, otherwise known as its genome. A dog is different from a plant, for example, because they have different genomes. But within one organism, all the cells have the same genome. Multicellular growth is mitotic asexual cell division, which simply clones the DNA. So, first up, we must confront the question, how is it, for example, that a rose's flower grows differently from its leaves or its stem? In other words, if the DNA instructions are the same in every cell of the organism, how do we explain its differentiation? The answer is that the genes are regulated. Hair follicle cells have the genes to express the hair protein, keratin, turned on. Cheek cells have keratin genes switched off. Bone cells secrete calcium. Muscle cells do not. The different types of cells result from selective activation of the genome that they all have in common. Humans have more than 30,000 potentially active DNA sequences or genes. But they are never all turned on at once. Only a small percentage may be expressing themselves in a given cell at a given time. The mechanisms are various and complex. They range from packing parts of the DNA away from contact with enzymes to regulator, enhancer and silencer sequences which bind proteins and stop their activity. Some genes are stimulated when a particular trigger inside the cell or even out in the environment is present. For example, plant genes for making chloroplasts become more active in the presence of light. Some genes get shut down for life. There are many cases of permanent switch off. For example, many animals cannot replace lost body parts. Once the genes which differentiate the body have done their job, they're switched off for life. Even though all the genes are still there in every cell, it seems that cell specialization becomes irreversible. That isn't the case for some organisms. The head of this flatworm has been split in two, and each half has regenerated a new half head. Clearly, the genes of this creature have not permanently switched off their head growing ability and plants can all regenerate. Virtually all plants have this amazing ability to redifferentiate. It's called totipotency, and it means that any cell in the plant can take on the role of any other. In other words, any cell can take on the role of any other cell. And each cell takes its signal as to which genes it will express from the immediate environment. For example, this cutting. Now, if you stick that into the ground, the cells at the base of the cutting will produce roots, whereas these up here in the sunshine and the air will produce shoots and leaves. And this will give you a brand new plant, an exact copy of its parent. For years, gardeners have exploited this totipotency in plant cells to produce plant clones. Now, sexual reproduction involving seed mixes the genes together, whereas Asexual reproduction involving clones maintains that same genome, and that's really useful. Here's an example why. This olive tree behind me was planted over 170 years ago from a cutting brought out from England. It's a magnificent tree, and it's still producing crops every year. Cuttings are made by taking a branch from that tree and chopping it up into truncheon-like pieces, like this. Now, why do we do it? We want to maintain the characteristics of the various olive varieties. For an example, this is the lovely big Spanish green and the calamata, both totally different. Now, if those plants were grown from seed, in other words, if they were no longer a clone, 
those characteristics would be gone and you'd finish up normally with a very small black fruit. So if cloning works so well, why do both plants and animals also reproduce sexually? What's the point of sexual reproduction? One answer, it seems, is the need to cope with error. DNA and to damage. Take a well-known example. The sun is hot. Most of the dangerous end of its spectrum is absorbed by the atmosphere. But some gets through. Ultraviolet can smash delicate molecules to bits. DNA is a reasonably tough molecule. But we know skin cancers can form from too much exposure. Cancer is a case of damaged DNA. A gene involved in limiting cell growth is randomly changed and stops making the protein that puts the brakes on. The cell divides wildly to become a dangerous melanoma. Even at the level of bacteria, life fights back with DNA correcting enzymes. But radiation, chemicals, or even spontaneous errors in replication are all possible ways of corrupting DNA. And the more DNA an organism carries, the more likelihood of errors slipping through the net. Any random change to a gene is called a mutation. A mutation in an active gene will probably wreck its expression, although there's a chance it won't. For example, a mutation which resulted in an RNA codon being altered from AGA to AGG would make no functional change because AGA and AGG both code for the amino acid arginine. The resulting protein would still be the same. It may also be that even if the protein is altered, the alteration might not impair its chemical activity. Plus, it seems that a lot of DNA is repetitious or completely non-functional. Up to 97% of human DNA may have no genetic significance at all. Mutations in these areas would likely have no effect. The same goes for genes that are switched off. Although in these cases, the error is a bomb that could go off at some other time. So while most mutations are neutral, a mutation in an active gene is usually bad news. Oscar is a case in point. A key protein required to keep the lenses in his eyes properly anchored was missing or not working properly. Blindness is the result. Oscar's case raises the difference between a local mutation in a body cell, such as a skin cancer, and a transmitted mutation in a germ cell. The eyesight mutation didn't happen in Oscar. It happened in a germ cell somewhere back in his breed line and was copied in the reproductive process. Thus, every cell in Oscar's body has the defective gene, not just one or two. But of course, not every terrier in Oscar's line goes blind. Sexual reproduction mixes genes and provides two sets of chromosomes, one from the father and one from the mother. Other terriers might have the defective gene on one set of chromosomes, but because there is an undamaged gene on the other set, the correct protein is expressed and the problem never shows up. The mutated gene in this case is recessive, meaning that its effect is masked. But that doesn't mean that it isn't there. If, by chance, an offspring is born with two recessives, well, that's what happened to Oscar. Sexual reproduction benefits a species the most if the population is large and diverse. In this way, the chance of bad genes showing up on both chromosomes is reduced and most individuals remain healthy and strong. Where pets are concerned, humans have been manipulating their breeding for centuries. To develop various traits that we humans feel are desirable, we restrict the breeding regime to individuals that express these traits. For example, terriers with terriers, Siamese cats with Siamese cats. This has the effect of restricting the gene pool. 
So the chance of emphasizing the bad genes along with the genes that we want becomes greater too. In the wild though, a blind dog would probably die. A hard fact about life is that individuals with dysfunctional active genes tend to be killed off before they can reproduce. So there is a vital piece of arithmetic that any species must beat to stay in existence. It must have enough accurately copied offspring or it dies out. It has to beat its own mutation rate. The more complex its DNA, the more mutations it risks. Having many offspring is one way to reduce the risk. Mixing in fresh genes through sexual reproduction is another. With sex in the equation, even though some unfortunate individuals may get a double dose of bad genes, it is possible for others to get a good set, even from flawed parents. <laughs> On rare occasions, a mutation may actually be helpful to an organism, assisting survival. Take just one example. This Australian plant makes a poison, fluoroacetate, in its leaves. It probably kept animals at bay for thousands of years. Any mutation which, by chance, improved an animal's ability to detoxify this poison was an advantage because it offered extra food. Natural selection did the rest. Now there are populations of Australian animals that are fluoroacetate resistant. They have adapted. Sexual reproduction enhances both genetic consistency and this ability to adapt because it is the most potent form of genetic mixing. While clones have identical DNA, sex creates unique offspring. Sexual reproduction ensures a subtly different DNA sequence each time. Except for identical twins, each person has a slightly different genome. The greatest differences occur in sequences for non-coding DNA. And this is because mutations within these regions are neutral and therefore they can accumulate. So comparing these regions is a good technique for personal identification. What we do is amplify these regions and compare them on a gel such as this one. Each DNA sample is loaded into a different well and the DNA migrates through the gel according to size. So heavier DNA fragments remain closer to the top of the gel whilst lighter DNA fragments migrate further through the gel. Here we have a DNA sample from a mother, a father and their child. And you can see that the child has inherited a heavy allele from its mother whilst a lighter allele from the father. Meaning that this child is genetically different to both its mother and its father. Therefore, this child is a genetically unique individual. Mutation and natural selection drive life to adapt. And complex organisms use sex to enhance the process. Adaptation over ages leads to new species. It's evolution. Humans, however, are learning how to shortcut evolution. Now we can manipulate DNA. We can now insert new genes or switch existing genes on to make an organism produce useful substances. This is a brand new way of using life. Biotechnology.